Bibles, open the book of 1 Corinthians, 1 Corinthians chapter number 3 this morning, if you would. We finished up Esther, and I want to preach this morning, this afternoon, uh, one, one idea, one concept. Hebrews chapter 12, we looked at it for a few Sunday nights now, for our God is a consuming fire. Our God is a consuming fire. We instruct our children not to play with fire or else you'll get burned. Children always listen. Do they not? Children always heed to the careful instruction from their parents. At least I hope yours do because mine sometimes have the other reaction. A few years back, we had a little bonfire in the backyard. It's fall, is it not? And we love fall. Like I mentioned earlier, the weather outside is just beautiful. Apples and uh, apple orchards. Hopefully we can still have that right now, right? And uh, bonfires, s'mores, all that stuff. I love the fall. Do you love the fall as well? And just about when it's done, I love the winter time. When winter's there, I love the springtime. I love the summertime. But I love fall right now. And uh, we're apt to build a few fires at our house. You're aware of that, my affinity for bonfires. And uh, I told the boys to be careful. If you get too close to fire, bad things happen. Well, one of my sons, who will, re will rename nameless, I would not think to name my oldest son, who is the same name as me. I will not name him this morning. And uh, that just wouldn't be fair to his life. But I'm not naming him, all right? Not my oldest son. I'm not going to name him. Uh, he wandered too close to the fire a few years back, and all of a sudden he yells, Ow! And his hair on the one side had instantly curled the whole side of his head. He said, Dad, is my head okay? And I was like a father full of compassion and love and tenderness. Those are my greatest qualities, I think. I burst into laughter like you're laughing right now. It just flowed from the inside out. I began to laugh as every little hair on the head was just curled in the fire, you know, hits that. Oh, he goes, oh no, he runs inside to his mother. And she goes, like only a mother can say, what happened and what have you done? Followed quickly by my name, like somehow I had a part in this. I responded quickly. I told the boys to stay away from the fire. Right. Obviously they should listen. Right, dads? I told them that something bad would happen. You know, and, and I'm sure she followed up with, they just followed your lead or something like that, I'm sure. Well, they were fine. You recovered. But we do warn our children, don't play with fire, don't play with matches, or you will get burned, right? Bible says here in Hebrews chapter 12 that our God is a consuming fire. I'm afraid, Christian, that sometimes we play with that fire. And if we play with that fire, it is at our own risk. It is at our own condemnation. It is at our own, uh, our, our own issue, our own thought, if we play with that fire. We've looked at it, that our, our God is a fire that rekindles. We need that rekindling fire in our life. And we had a tremendous camp, a tremendous school camp this past week. Lord willing, in the afternoon service, we'll have some testimonies. I know it's down home Sunday, but I want you to hear what God did in the hearts and lives of our young people. They got rekindled this past week. I preached on that, but some of us could still use some rekindling in our life. Some of us are dry. Some of us are just smoldering. And they got on fire this past week. We'll hear that in the afternoon service. He's a fire that rekindles. He's a fire that refines. But today, if you would look in 1 Corinthians chapter number 3, beginning in verse number 12, where the Bible says, Now if any man build upon this foundation, we'll look at that in just a moment, what this foundation is, gold, silver, precious stones, wood, hay, and stubble. Every man's work shall be made manifest, for the day shall declare it, because it shall be, read those next three words with me please, revealed by fire. The fire shall try every man's work of what sort it is. If any man's work abide, which he hath built thereupon, he shall receive a reward. If any man's work shall be burned, he shall suffer loss, but he himself shall be saved, yet so as by fire. This morning, with the help of the Holy Spirit, 
God's Word. I want to look at our God as a consuming fire. He's a fire that rekindles. He's a fire that refines. But He's also a fire that reveals. He's a fire that reveals. Lord, we come to You this morning with humbleness. Lord, we need Your help. I need Your help this morning. Lord, I don't want to come to church just to sit here. Lord, I just don't just want to talk for the next few moments and give some of my own thoughts and opinions. Lord, we need your truth from your word. Lord, I'm asking for your Holy Spirit to meet with us, to touch our hearts today. Lord, to reveal and illuminate areas that are not pleasing to you. Lord, I need your help. I need your strength. I've tried to do my part in study. Lord, if there's something in my notes or on my mind that, that shouldn't say that I shouldn't say this morning, Lord, strike it from there and help me to overlook it. And Lord, help me to say those things that would please you and and further your cause, your kingdom. And Lord, I pray that if there's someone here today who's never trusted you as their Savior, that they would trust you today. That they would not leave this service unsaved, but would believe on you. Lord, I pray for the Christians here today who have already trusted you, that you would illuminate areas in their life that they're living for themselves. That you would reveal it to them. In Jesus' name I ask. Amen. We see in Scripture... That as a fire, as a revealer, God reveals certain things. He will often reveal direction to us. A word is a lamp unto my feet, a light unto my path. God's word is a revealer of direction, it's a revealer of duty. What doth the Lord require, O man? And he, he begins to tell us what our duty is, but he's also a revealer in this passage of decisions. Call it choices. The way we live. All of us make decisions every single day, all day long. You decided this morning when to get up and how to get up. Happy, sad, on time, late. You decided then uh, what to wear to church today, whether it was going to be uh, some down-home clothes, jeans and a flannel, or some other sort. We make good decisions. Some decisions not so good. Some bad decisions have long-term consequences, some just a few minutes. Why did I order the Big Mac? That was a bad decision. Good and bad decisions. Some of the decisions we make are short-term when we should have made long-term decisions, and some are long-term that we should have made should have been short-term. We all make decisions, and we know from Scripture that our time here on earth, our our eternal nature is limited by our finite time. We're only here on this earth so long. James tells us that our life is but a vapor. It appears for a moment, then it vanisheth away. We know that from Michigan because you've walked outside and, and like a little kid, you know, little kids do this, oh, look, Daddy, I'm smoking. Right? And they blow in the air and the, the breath comes out and then what happens? It's gone. The Bible says that is what our life is like on this earth. It is here just for a moment, then vanishes away. But the, yet the scripture tells us right here that we will be judged, we will be uh, shown, made manifest from our time on earth for eternal consequences. Or in essence, that God's fire will reveal our limited time in an eternal way. We only have a few moments on this earth and God's word says that we will be judged as Christians the eternality or carnality of our decisions. Either our decisions will be eternal in nature or they will be carnal or fleshly in nature. The fire of God reveals that. In this passage, if you look at verse number 12, the Bible says, Now if any man build upon this, next word is foundation. What he's talked about in the previous verses is how he has helped lay the foundation, and that foundation is Jesus Christ. He's talking to the Corinthian church, the church at Corinth, the church that is fraught with problems. But one thing they know, one thing they have settled is that they have a foundation of Jesus Christ. They've settled their home in heaven. All right, They were bound and headed straight toward hell, but they have trusted Jesus Christ, and now they're headed for life eternal. We're alluded to that at the end of this passage, that even if everything burns up, they're still saved as so as by fire. That foundation is shown in Jesus Christ. It's by the grace of God. And in 1 Corinthians chapter 15, Paul re- refines what that foundation looks like. He says, I delivered unto you, first of all, 
by, and you've also received that, by which also ye are saved, how that Christ died for your sins. He was buried and rose again the third day, according to the Scriptures. There's a foundation here that is understood. That foundation is Jesus Christ. To recognize and understand that we are sinners. I'm a sinner, you're a sinner. But the Bible tells me, as Paul says, but Christ died for our sins, yours and mine. And that while we were yet sinners, Christ died. That is the foundation. The foundation is accepting Jesus Christ, trusting in Jesus Christ, trusting that Christ died for my sins in payment for my sin. That is the foundation that Paul is talking about. Sometimes people doubt their salvation. I have in the past. As I've worked with some young people, work with people, I usually say there's three reasons someone doubts their salvation. First reason, they're not saved. It makes sense. If you're not saved, you're going to doubt about being saved. Makes sense to me, right? They've never trusted Jesus Christ as your Savior. Second reason is there is sin in their life. The Bible says that if I walk in the Spirit, I'll have the fruit of the Spirit, which is love, joy, peace, fruit of the Spirit. If I'm not walking in the Spirit, I don't have peace. I have turmoil, all right, and one way that turmoil will come, that unrest will come, is in the aspect of my salvation. Third way is outside influences. Doubt their salvation. You may be here today and you may not know that God loves you, but He loves you so much He says on Jesus to die for you. And I encourage you to, if you've never trusted Jesus Christ, to trust Him. Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ. What does that mean? Believe that He died for you. Believe that if you trust Him, He will save you and change your destination from hell to heaven. I was six years old as a young person. In junior church or Sunday school, one of those two places where I trusted Jesus Christ as my Savior. Saved from a life of sin, you better believe it. I don't have a testimony as some would have where I had years wasted, and I'm glad I don't. I'm thankful for that. But by, by, by the grace of God, a sinner? Well, I should just ask my parents. If I was a sinner, you better believe it. Right? They're right over there. You'd ask them that. Well, don't ask them too, too much detail, all right? They said I was 11 months old when I first got into some real trouble. 11 months. I guess my mom was calling me, and I said, No. Having kids, you don't have to teach them that stuff, do you? They know how to say no to you. The sinner. That's the foundation that we have. And Paul takes that foundation and now goes on to this concept that our God is a revealer by fire. So he kind of, not assumes, but says, listen, you are saved. You've trusted Christ. But now that you're saved, don't play with fire or you're going to get burnt. Don't play with matches. Don't play with your life. We have too many Christians who are out there living life for themselves. Paul says, I'm here to warn you that our God is a revealer by fire. If you would look at these verses, if you see a few aspects about this. Verse number 13. If you look at that in your Bibles with me, I want to point out that the first aspect of this concept is that it is unavoidable. My friend, if you've trusted Jesus Christ, your works will be made manifest. Look at verse number 13. And every man's work shall be made manifest. You see that? Keep on reading. For the day shall declare it, because it shall be revealed by fire, and the fire shall try every man's work of what sort it is. Do you see that in the verse? I'm not making that up. Why would, in that verse... Why would Paul, four different times, in the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, make a declarative phrase, use, use a declarative verb in that way? Because it's going to happen. That's why. I, I, I was studying this, and I kind of pictured as a parent, and I often bring that in, there's sometimes you're really trying to get something across. So you don't just say, this will happen. You say, listen, this is going to happen, and this will happen, and you better be ready because it's coming, and it's going to happen. Did you catch it that it's going to happen? It is unavoidable. Say that with me. It is unavoidable. It will be made manifest. Who is involved? The Bible twice says every man's work. Speaking to Christians. It is unavoidable. Who's involved? Every Christian under the sound of my voice. Every Christian who has ever lived. Every Christian who will live. Once you've trusted Christ, the Bible says your work, your decisions will be made manifest. 
what's involved, our work, or what we do. He's not talking about work just like, did you go work in the shop today? Did you go work as a contractor? He's talking about the work that we do, how we get up in the morning and how we either serve ourselves or serve Jesus Christ, how we come to church and I'm glad you're sitting here, I'm glad you're tuned in, but you know you can sit in church and not be serving Jesus Christ. Just because you're sitting here, just because you're listening, does not mean that you're on board with what Christ wants to do in your life. You can be sitting there saying, uh-uh, not me. Mm-mm. That's not the work of God in your life. Every man's work is inescapable. It's unavoidable. But I want to point out also that it is unconcealable. The Bible says every man's work shall be made manifest. Now, I'm not talking about how sometimes the Bible says, be sure your sin will find you out. Though that is a true concept. I read the story about one time there was a a man who had been drinking all night, came home drunk, snuck up the stairs quietly and looked in the bathroom mirror and bandaged the bang-ups and the mishaps on his face, the fight he'd been in earlier, then proceeded to sneak into bed. Thought to himself, ha-ha, tricked my, trick my wife, she'll never, she'll never find out. Woke up the next morning and saw his wife standing over him and said, you came home drunk last night, didn't you? He said, no, honey, I didn't. And she goes, well, then explain then why there's so many bandages on the mirror in the bathroom. <laughs> Not talking about that, though that is true. And sometimes as, as Christians, we, I believe, sometimes unnecessarily focus just that, that Jesus is watching you in a negative sense. Though that is absolutely true. Don't miss that. Jesus is with us all the time. He sees everything. It is in a negative sense. But this verse also gives it to us in a positive sense. Sometimes we just focus on the fact that, listen, young person, listen, adult, listen, husband, listen, wife, listen, man, listen, woman, be sure you choose, make the right choice because Jesus is right behind you. You've heard that joke, Jesus is watching you? There was a man, a burglar, broke into a house. Had a talking parrot there. The parrot said, careful, Jesus is watching you. But it stopped all of a sudden. He's gone here looking around, sees the parrot. What? And again, the parrot responds, Jesus is watching you. What? What's wrong with you? Is that all you can say, you dumb parrot? Jesus is watching you. You know what? What's your name? The parrot responds, Clarence. Burglar begins to just laugh, mock, and scorn. <laughs> What kind of idiot would name a parrot Clarence? The same idiot that named the Rottweiler Jesus. <laughs> Sometimes we think that's how God sits in our life. Just waiting for us to take one step off the sidewalk so that he can knock us, not back on the sidewalk, but out of this universe. It is true that Jesus sees us all the time. It ought to bring caution and fear, a holy fear in our life. But this verse brings the other side, that he's watching us not only for maybe mistakes, but he's watching us for the good decisions, for the ways that please him in our life, for the times that maybe you, you've responded just the right way and no one else saw it, but Jesus did. The times that in your spirit you were about to go off, fly off the handle, but you didn't. You sowed to the Spirit. You responded the right way. Jesus saw that. He sees us, and it's unconcealable. You can't hide it from Him. Maybe it was a time that you gave a gospel track. No one else saw it. No one else knows. But Jesus saw it. Time you're generous. In the offering, you put your last little bit. Jesus saw it. Jesus sees that. I read a story about a, from a pastor. His wife, they talked about how they were a young couple in ministry, young church. They struggled like sometimes we do with the offering. As it came, they knew that they had their $20 to put in for their, their offering that day, their story, but it was their last $20. They struggled and they, though their words, obeyed the Lord and put in the plate, not knowing what the next meal, gas, thing would look like. That afternoon, apparently, the story went, they went out calling Went out soul winning at afternoon. Came to house somebody, a church member, check on him, shut in. 
As they were leaving, a, a lady pressed something in their hand. $20 bill. But as they looked at it, it was wrapped around another $20 bill. It was wrapped around another $20 bill. That story could be repeated time and time again. Could it not be? Have we not seen the provision of God? But it shows the gaze of our Lord. You see, this fire, it is unconcealable. You can't hide anything. The Bible says, the Bible word there, it is made manifest, verse number 13. It is shown, clearly revealed. Nothing will be hid. Jesus repeats this in Luke chapter 8, or says it previously, for nothing is secret that shall not be made manifest, neither anything that shall not be made known and come abroad. Or basically, what the Bible tells us is in this revealing, everything will be out there. Kind of like maybe an older person who's let me tell you what I really think. You've had these conversations. Except God will show us what He really He really knows. It is open, but it is plain. The Bible teaches it is plain. It shall it shall be declared. All right, it'll be revealed by fire, but it shall be declared. It'll be plain. There'll be no masking, no deception. To borrow, I think, my least favorite phrase, it is what it is that day. It is what it is. What we have sown to God, what we, our work will, we, will be shown, and it will be there. There will be no masking. We can't paint it in a different light. We can't give an excuse. It will be what it is. See, God's watching. He's going to reward us, but we'll suffer the loss of it. The story told about a college they had a large basket of red, delicious apples. Apparently, as the story goes, I read the story was a Bible college. We can just pick one. Put the red, big, red, delicious apples in the basket at the end of the, or at the beginning of the cafeteria line and said, Jesus is watching, please take one. In hopes to maybe curate the favor of the students and their love for God to only take just one apple. At the end of the line, there was a tray of butter cookies. And some student had written this note, take as many as you want, Jesus is down watching the apples. <laughs> Fact is, God's watching everything, isn't he? He can watch you, he can watch me. He'll reveal all those things. It is unconcealable, it's unavoidable, but it's unconcealable. He'll declare it in a way that, that we can't excuse away. Boy, we all have excuses, do we not? Well, I, I couldn't do that because... Fill in the blank. I couldn't come to church because I was whatever. I couldn't do that. I couldn't give a gospel track there. I, I couldn't have the right reaction because they hit me. Second. How can I have the right reaction? We all have excuses, but that day there'll be no excuses. There'll be no excuses. Well, officer, you see, I was speeding because... You see, judge, I had to because... You see, honey, I didn't have a choice, and, and don't you understand? And You see, pastor, I had to, I had no choice. There'll be no excuses that day. The perfect judge, the perfect revealer, Jesus Christ, the fire, will reveal it. All our excuses will be stripped away. We are good at excuses. Are we not? We can laugh at our kids and say they have good excuses or foolish excuses, but adults were, if not better masters at it. Oh, I got caught by the train. That's why I'm late for work. Really? You weren't late before that? Well, you know. It's unconcealable. But notice here in verse number 14, it's also unbiased. Verses 14 and 15, the Bible says, the beginning of each verse, if any man's work. In verse 15, if any man's work. I love the fact that there are no favorites in this. Uh, there's, no, there's no passes given. The Bible says it's unbiased, it's impartial. You have as much opportunity as, as your wife or your spouse or your mom or your dad or your pastor, the assistant pastor, youth pastor, young person, your teacher, 
Sunday school teacher, it doesn't matter what you think the status may be. It doesn't matter how much money or, or any social status or any, quote, spiritual status. There is no bias. There's impartiality with this judge. God does not judge us just by the past, but according to his goodness. He's not weighted by past thoughts or decisions that we have made. You see, we judge things based upon our experience with that person. Well, I know what they meant because I remember 10 years ago. Whoa. (laughs) Mic drop. Boom. Thankfully, God just judges what is. Not distracted. I'm glad I say it this way. I'm glad that God is not just a home team ref. You've seen that before, haven't you? You go to a sporting event and you're like, man, this ref is just calling it one way. You ever felt that in a sporting event before? It doesn't matter if it's true or not. We can feel that way. And, and every call that doesn't go our way, well, he got that one right. But this other one, oh my goodness, I'm glad that God is not just a home team ref. He'll call it fairly. He'll call it right. But notice, though, it's unavoidable. It's unconcealable. It's unbiased, but it's unchangeable. This morning, my challenge for you is to realize that every day you are preparing yourself for this revealing. Once that day is past, that day is unchangeable. When we stand before God that day, and that's what the Bible tells in Corinthians chapter 3, that man's work, every man's work, will be revealed. And any man's work which shall abide, shall receive a reward. Any man's work shall be burned, shall suffer loss. There's two types of work. There's precious versus the perishable. There's wood, hay, and stubble. We'll look more this afternoon at what that looks like, what that looks like in our life. But there's also gold, silver, and precious stones. If I were to ask you today, you're going to build a house, what are you going to build it out of? You would not say, I'm going to build my house out of gold, silver, and precious stones. You would say, I'm going to build my house out of wood, right? Some earthly materials. One of the problems is that we approach our natural life, our spiritual life, the same way. Oh, this makes sense over here, so it makes sense what I do over here. But the Bible tells us that there are two different types of building materials. There's the precious versus the perishable, or the ruined versus the rewarded. The Bible says, no man live unto himself, and no man die unto himself. For whether we live, we live unto the Lord, or whether we die, we die unto the Lord. For to this end, Christ both died and rose and revived that he might be the Lord, both of the dead and living. For, as, for it is written, the Bible says, as I live, saith the Lord, every knee shall bow to me and every tongue shall confess to God. So then every one of us shall give account of himself to God. That day will be revealing by fire. My challenge to you today is to make sure you live in light of that day. Because what you do today matters on that day. What you do tomorrow matters on that day. And if all you do is walk out and say, well, that was nice, Pastor. God bless you. And go live your own life. You will on that day have things burned up. What I want on that day for all of us, for myself and for you, as I prepare you for that day, is to kind of be like a grown sports team. You ever notice that these men or women, adults, when they win a game, they act like they've kind of lost it? Jumping all around, right? Jumping all around, slapping each other on the back, high-fiving, kind of like nothing else matters because they've won. You know that we can stand for Jesus Christ that day. Because of his grace, because of his mercy, we can win that day and have the reward. We don't have to suffer loss. We don't have to have regret and shame that day. We can have reward and blessing and a wonderful reception by our Lord. How? choices we make along the way. Today, tonight, tomorrow, and Tuesday, and Wednesday, 
and Thursday and Friday. What I'm saying is that we're supposed to live like a Christian, not just on Sundays, but on Mondays. And live for God on Tuesdays. And live for God on Wednesdays. Live for God when it seems to be going well. Live for God when it seems to be going poorly. Because one day, every decision that we have made will be revealed by fire. For our God is consuming fire. And don't foolishly think you can play with that fire. Because you'll get burned. Lord, I thank you for loving us. And Lord, just because of your love and grace, we can even live for you. Lord, help us to have a heart and a mindset, a spirit that is looking to live for you, to make our life count for Jesus Christ. Lord, I'm afraid that too often we just live in the here and now and forget the ever after. Oh God, I pray and ask that you'd help our hearts to be turned and focused on what you've called us to do. Lord, you've called us to much bigger things just to work a job and to live in a house. Lord, you've called us to live for you. I wonder if you're here this morning. Say, Pastor, pray for me. As you spoke, God spoke to me. As you spoke, God spoke to me, and I need to refocus some things in my life. Maybe you say, I've not been living in light of that fire that's going to be a revealer. I need prayer. I need to pray and have God help me make the right decisions so that what I do today will not be burned up on that day. Let's say that in saying, Pastor, pray for me. As you spoke, God spoke to me. I want my life to count for Jesus Christ. Would you slip your hand up, slip back down then? Amen. Amen. Who else? Would you pray for me? As you spoke, God spoke to me. Amen. Who else? I wonder if you're here this morning. I wonder if, as I spoke about the foundation of Jesus Christ, if something was going on in your heart. Maybe you've never trusted Jesus Christ as your Savior. You don't know that if you died today, you'd go to heaven. We'd love to open a Bible and show you just a moment how you could know for sure. And I'd love to pray for you now. Who would say, Pastor, I'm not sure I'm on my way to heaven, but I'd like to be sure. When you pray for the others, would you pray for me as well? I've never trusted Jesus Christ as my Savior. Something's going on here. Would you pray for me? Would you slip your hand up, slip back down, we'll see it. And I'll draw no more attention to you than I did anyone else. I'd love to pray for you today. I hope there's someone like that today who's here. Would you pray for me? Lord, bless this time of invitation. May all those who are touched by your Spirit respond in the way they ought to, Lord. Well, it's easy to say no and grieve your Spirit. Lord, may we respond the right way. May we be faithful to your word. Lord, if there's someone here or online who's never trusted you, I pray, Lord, that you would touch their heart and they trust you today in Jesus' name. Amen. As we stand to our feet, heads bowed, eyes closed. Piano's already playing. If you need to do business with God, the altar's open. You come. If you need someone to talk to you, we'll have folks at the front. If you're not sure you're on your way to heaven, we'd love to open a Bible and show you how you can know for sure. Slip out of your seat now and you respond to the way God's touched your heart today. are praying now. A young man came to get baptized today. We'd love to talk to you. If you're not sure you're way to heaven, we'd love to open God's word. If you're with us online, you've never trusted Jesus Christ as your Savior, there's a number on the screen. Would you call us? We have someone standing by the phones right now. We'd love to open the Bible over the phone and communicate to you the truth about how God loves you and Jesus died for you. Trust Him today. Lord, thank you for loving us. Thank you for your grace and mercy, Lord. 
Lord, we want to please you with our life. Lord, we only have one life to live for you. May we not waste it. Lord, thank you for those who have been touched by your word this morning, for this young man who came to get baptized. Lord, I pray that all we do would please you. In Jesus' name I ask. Amen.